He's gonna have a heart attack at some point and then <laughs> wake up without a no. I got look, I got my mug my mug here and my thermos. <laughs> at least we'll have this uh this highlight, but uh tomorrow we'll start preparing funeral. Uh, yeah. Funeral It'll be worth it for the highlight. Yes. Yes. Um so this is from the Mises Institute, like I said, libertarian think tank, uh named after Ludwig von Mises. Uh, I think he's considered an Austrian economist, but I just call him one of the neoclassical economists, um, anti-Marxist, bourgeois economists, um, and they like to pump out a lot of nonsense. So we haven't seen this video yet, but I'm sure it's intellectually honest and you know features some really genius level thinking and economic theory. So yeah, that was sarcasm. What is socialism? Economics studies human action. Using Wait, economics. Stop already. And how no, economics <laughs> isn't. That is the vaguest, most confused uh, sentence I've heard in a very long time. Economics studies human action that mixes up the universe. It, it <laughs> pretends that there's this particular thing that is a universal. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm already getting upset. No, it, it allows them by saying and that you, you'll hear that in almost every neoclassical economics class. And that's them setting up the utility theory of value, which is their theory that, you know, the market just figures everything out because it gives power to the consumers, you know, supply <laughs> and demand. Um, so we just have to leave companies alone and then, you know, give consumers all the power. So that's what they say is you know, the analysis of markets, the analysis of supply and demand curves, which is what they base everything on, just comes from human action and humans' decision to purchase things or not. That's where the demand curve comes from. Um, yeah, that's sort of the basis of Mises' is, uh, was it praxeology, he called it. He tries to uh, study human a individual human action as such, which is the dumbest thing because that doesn't exist. All action is informed by what creates it you know right and then creates right. something else and it's all right and you can't quantify like they'll use the demand and supply curves to determine things like price that are quantitative even though you can't quantify demand so it's an unfalsifiable mm -hmm. theory um so yeah modern economics is stupid read my article <laughs> um on neoclassical economics and postmodernism social systems create different results based on how they allocate resources. With a market economy, production is guided by enterprises seeking profit and Pause again. It's not just based on how they allocate resources. That stems from the relations of production, right? Which I guess you can say the means of production are resources which exist in the hands of the capitalists, but um, that's where like accumulation stems from. The fact that the workers are exploited working for the bosses. So the more surplus the boss, or I mean, the more the boss can drive the workers' wages down, the more surplus they can make um, and, and the more that they can accumulate, and, which is just distribution towards the top. Um, but it's not just distribution and resource allocation. It stems from the relations of production at the at the core of the system. Well, and already it's it's making this dichotomy between a market and planning as two separate social systems, and that's not what happens, right? There have been markets since the advent of property itself, really. Um, and there were markets in feudalism. There were markets in industrial capitalism. There are markets sort of in our modern financial capitalism. There are markets in socialism in every socialist country there's ever been. So the idea that um, profits and innovation are guiding these markets. One, isn't always the case. And two, isn't a qualifying feature. So basically what they're saying here is nothing. Right. And the false dichotomy that he provides, I cite it in my book on the purity fetish and in other articles I've done on China, just to critique the Western left because the Western left accepts this dichotomy. Mm -hmm. You either have a market economy or you have a planned economy. China has markets, therefore China's not socialist because socialism means full-scale planned economy. 
And that's just untrue because markets, you know, they've existed always, as Noah mentioned. Marx writes about pre-capitalist markets and volume three of capital and, not, and other places, theories of surplus value, uh, sections in the Grand Risa. And, uh, you know, wh what you find is that markets as a, a form of engaging in distribution end up working in accordance with the form of production that, that grounds the distribution. So the moment of production is like the, the ground, the backdrop for then the moment of distributions. And if there's markets in the moment of distributions, those are going to function in accordance with what the mode of production is. They're, uh, they're called by uh, Roland Bohr and other Chinese uh, scholars, a universal institutional form that can only exist insofar as it can concretize through uh, particular economic systems. And that means that markets always function differently. They function differently in feudalism and capitalism, and they'll function differently as they are functioning differently in socialism. Well, I like to think of it as the sphere of circul of, uh, the, the sphere of production is is the base. The relations of production are the base, and the sphere of circulation kind of grows out of that, develops out of that, um, and and that's how Marx frames capital. Capital Volume mm -hmm. One focuses on production. Um, capital Volume Two then focuses on the circulation that stems from that, and mm -hmm. you know it comes back to production in, in Volume Three. And then vo in Volume Three extends past that a bit too. But what they what what I wanted to focus on is what they're doing when they sort of uh, put it in terms of this dichotomy is confusing form for essence, right? Uh, we've seen Soviet planning, their version of it that arose from their particular material history, right? And so if it isn't um, the Soviet Union's particular form uh, of planning, then it isn't planning, right? But there are a million forms of planning that happen in all kinds of different situations. The U.S. economy is very, very, very planned. It is not run by a competitive market at all. It's run by financial institutions, and the, the commodities that are being sold are the underlying basis of that. But the, all of the markets are also planned. So just like in China, the socialist markets are planned. What is invested in is planned. It's just done differently and in different class interests. And innovation. With cronyism, government influences market outcomes with intervention. A command economy rejects markets entirely in favor of central planning. This is socialism. Under socialism, central planners control what is made, who makes it, and who benefits. While markets reward those who best serve customers, socialists promise that everyone's needs. None of this is true. How do they control who benefits? How do you control who benefits from a, the use value of a commodity? That's How just do they the control trend. what is made. <laughs> do they think like Soviet central planners were just like? Let's make a bunch of jumpsuits today. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, no. <laughs> and here's no what word. I mean. So I, real quick, here's what I mean by they're setting up the utility theory of value that customers, you know, decide everything. Um, well, markets reward the best or who serves the customers the best. It's all based on that um, demand theory as if everybody can afford everything that they want or that they demand under capitalism. Go ahead, Carlos. Now, word cronyism always pisses me off because it supposes that there's a non cronious, you know, uh, capitalism. And capitalism, the natural tendency in its form of competition is monopolization. Um, and, you know, the natural tendency at once it gets to a certain stage of development is to revolutionize the state. And, of course, you have the bourgeois revolutions and the uh, 18th and 19th century that create the capitalist state. So the government has uh, always been involved in uh, proliferating, you know, and sustaining the existing capitalist order. So to, to, you know, to imagine that there's this capitalism without government interference, without uh, big monopolies, um, you know, uh, influencing the market, it's just uh, completely absurd. And already in Adam Smith's uh, writings, he his main concern with the disturbing of the free market 
was not like labor unions or the government interfering so that people can have basic services. His main concern was the way that monopolies have tended to develop, collaborate with one another in order to then influence the markets for their own uh, for their own good, which is profit. And he saw that good, um, as in many instances, contrary to the common good of the people. And he shitted on capitalists for their, um, you know, uh, for their attacks of labor unions and worker combinations when they themselves are constantly in combination with each other to continue accumulating capital. So it's, it's, uh, it's you know, it's completely absurd. It's funny because when he uses the term invisible hand, he seems to be doing so condescendingly as if uh, capitalists are guided by a sense of uh, an invisible hand and sense of noblesse oblige or or just, you know, wanting to do the right thing. And he's saying that this is what we're trusting him for. But a lot of the time, libertarians today, by the way, will pretend that they agree with Adam Smith while having no idea what he actually said. But what they'll say is that well, right now what we have is this crony capitalism and there's never been a monopoly without the government. To which I always sort of go, wait a minute. There's never been a corporation without the government. There's never been money without the government. What are you talking about? Everything, all trade exists on is the government. <laughs> like, without the government, you don't even own things. It Society as a whole must recognize this ownership, which comes about and concretizes through a government and a constitution, etc. That's, I mean, what this ideology amounts to is a dogma. It's a dogma that um, private markets are the best and through the invisible hand, they always give the consumer and, and, and therefore the whole of society um, what's best, what's optimal. Um, and then any form of government goes against that. So all that we can do is minimize government. And like, as I'm talking about in my new book about Venezuela, um, if like you talk to one of these people who believes in neoclassical economics and you point out a place where government central planning made life better for people like Venezuela, they'll just explain around it in order to work backwards from their conclusion and say, no, 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 no. All the bad things that happened in Venezuela were because of the government. All the good things were because of private markets. Same with China, right? Everything, all China's economic growth, that's because of the private markets. Anything bad that happened, that's because of uh, the government and central planning. It's a dogma that, you know, mirrors, any, or, I mean, resembles any other kind of religious faith that you would have um, where they just worship the invisible hand of the market instead of a god are taken care of equally. Instead of individuals choosing what goods and services they prefer to spend their money on, they are provided only with what goods and services the central planners have chosen for them. Some people may reject the central plan. The result is that socialist countries tend to be politically authoritarian. The economic consequences of central planning are- I don't get how people think there can't be demand under socialism either. Like there can never be any demand inputs. It's just all what the central planners want. Um, like that state central plan um, is all based on what the people want. Like in China, the way they do it is there's party cadres who are assigned to every area. And it's their job to communicate with the people, understand what the people want and bring that back to the party and to the government and to the sectors of economic power so that, you know, they can produce what the people need and what they want. That is demand, right? Um, markets oftentimes don't meet the demand of society as a whole it, it can they can often meet the demand of those who have the most money um but uh they leave a lot of people wanting even in vital industries like housing health care and food well this See, has I, always been very interesting oh to sorry me. sorry sorry i didn't mean to play that this this argument's always been very interesting to me because they assume that we're not forced to only buy what these companies are selling, right? As if we ask for things and they make them, that's not how it works, right? They provide things and we buy them. We don't get to choose what's being made. So their whole idea that people are choosing, it's either, well, do we get a say by the people asking us what we want? 
Or do we not get a say in only what is made in the interests of these companies making more money off us? And that's what gets me. You know what I mean? For example, profits reward and encourage innovation and efficiency. If you are the first to create a new product or find a cheaper way to provide a service, the individual who risks capital is financially rewarded. Can we pause real quick? There is no incentive. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's so oh. much. They Already they've completely eliminated the production process and they act like, as if the owners are the ones innovating. Like Elon Musk is sitting at his desk designing rockets. That's not what happens. Workers are the ones innovating. Right. That there are people thinking up better ways to do things, etc. But they're not always the owner of something. No, they found that most innovations come from like the assembly line, come from, you know, the people who are closest to the product. Of course, of course, right. it comes from the people working with the product every day. And there are engineers whose literal job is to use that, use mm -hmm. science and what we know about technology and physics to, to innovate. Right. And, and any innovations created by those engineers aren't going to lead to higher pay. They're paid a set salary. It's going to lead to more money for the boss. And then they say, if you invest capital in a good idea, you're rewarded. How many people in a country where 70 percent of us live paycheck to paycheck have capital to just invest in a new idea? Right. So really, capitalism is a fetter on innovation because regular people who have good ideas, who have good innovations, um, aren't incentivized to bring them forward. They don't have the resources to bring them forward, um, especially in our, you know, monopolized uh, financial state of capitalism that we live in, where uh, capital and wealth are so heavily concentrated at the top. Or worse, they're working for someone else, have that idea, and those bastards steal the idea, take ownership of it, and profit off of it. You think the, the, yeah. the McDonald's shareholders uh, invented the Chicken McNugget? They did not. Well, they that was Thomas Edison. Lab, right? Elon Musk is just a modern-day Thomas Edison. Exactly. Are paying 100%. people to make innovations for them and then claiming that they didn't. Right. The idea that capitalists are innovating is so silly. And maybe, maybe a handful of people during the Industrial Revolution, yes, Especially in the U.S. where um, there were protections put in place to allow that sort of thing to happen from the government, then okay, a very, very small uh, section. But that is the, the exception, not the rule. Yep. To innovate because the rewards go back to the planners. Central planners, to the planners only on their own knowledge, which is always less than the collective knowledge of society. Think of the difference between a published encyclopedia, which is static and quickly becomes dated, and a decentralized alternative, like Wikipedia, which is constantly evolving and growing. Markets. And filled with bullshit. And also markets don't give people 100% in information. You know, we don't know what's going on in the markets, but. No, that acts as if we're all informed consumers. I know nothing about most of the things I buy. Nothing. A unique piece of knowledge. Prices. Since many resources, such as steel, have a variety of different end uses, prices signal whether the use of a specific resource satisfies the top priority of the community. Should a factory produce no, they don't. meals? In a market economy, prices indicate when there is a greater need for one product over another. So this stems back to what I wrote my article about in the utility theory of value, right? Price is um, heavily correlated to uh, wage or I mean, um, the amount of labor content and labor time that's in a product. Um, and, you know, uh, Paul Cockshot has done that by looking at every industry and the prices of the commodities in that industry versus the amount of labor that goes into them. And they're over 94 percent corollary. But what these guys try and do is say, no, 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 no. Prices are determined by consumer demand, where consumer <laughs> demand intersects with supply. And then you ask them, okay, well, let's test that scientifically. How do you measure consumer demand? Well, you can't. You can't quantify consumer demand. Well, oh, then our theory is unfalsifiable. We're just plotting, you know, we're finding the price point on a graph and saying this is where the D and the S intersect. 
Well, the D and the S are subjective. You just made them up. Alfred Marshall pulled them out of his ass so that, you know, the bourgeoisie would have an economic science to use after Marx destroyed classical economics. Um, that's all this is. Um, maybe maybe we should go over how uh, value is alienated human labor real quick. I mean, the value, say where a, a commodity has a price, right? Or, uh, uh, or value is realized in the value form money when when it's sold by the capitalist right what what has happened before this is they buy all of the commodities it takes to make the commodity they're going to make this includes human labor right all of the constant capital going into it and then the variable capital now the price of these commodities that it takes to make it and then the value going into it from the labor, turns these commodities into something new, a new thing. The labor is transferred from the workforce into this commodity, which is then sold, right? And this the, the value of this commodity is then higher than the materials it took to make it and the labor that went into it. And the difference there is what we call surplus value right? Everything beyond what they pay the workers. And if it weren't uh, that much value, more valuable, then it wouldn't get made. Yes, that's a good, I think that was worth explaining for sure. In a command economy, government blindly makes that decision. Without economic... Pause it real quick. Government blindly just makes this China is like racing ahead of the West. How can they just sit here and lie? It's crazy. They can say anything because there's money behind it. Yep. ...by prices, a complex economy becomes impossible. The socialist goal of redistribution of wealth makes the... So this actually stems from a Mises idea, which is called the economic calculation problem, mm. which is the idea that... The, and it stems, I mean, it, it fits in perfectly with Alfred Marshall's utility theory of value, uh, which is the idea that the economy is so complex, there's so many inputs, you can never plan an economy, even though, you know, uh, there have been planned economies. And Paul Cockshot has shown how um, calculation technology has evolved um, and computers have evolved to make it fairly easy to plan an economy. And actually, there's so much concentration and monopolization that, uh, um, private firms like Walmart essentially centrally plan, you know, where they're going to have all their commodities um, based on uh, the um, behavior of consumers and, and things like that. It's basically a, a system of central planning that could be um, used. That tech, that same sort of technology could be used to uh, plan a socialist economy. So um, the the thesis in Mises' economic calculation problem is that, yeah, I mean, he, he claims to know the future. And I wrote about this in my article responding to the neoclassical economists as well. But he says socialism will never, ever, ever, ever be possible because of how complex the capitalist economy is. And how could you say that? How could you know how technology is going to evolve? How could you say it's completely impossible to, to do anything? Um, so it's it's a dogma, like I said, a dogma that... There can never be um, any kind of planning. The market will always do better, which is clearly, clearly false. Look at China's poverty alleviation. That has put a, a nail in the coffin of that argument for good. Um, but these neoclassical economists still hang on to it. And like I said, they say, oh, no, nope, that's just because of capitalism in China. And anything bad in China is because of the government. It is literally uh, religious faith. And the economic calculation problem, the idea that no kind of planning will ever be possible, we know because we adhere to the invisible hand like it's a god. Um, it's it's an example of the dogmatic nature of the whole thing. Um, and, and the Koch brothers have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on institutes like the Mises Institute pushing this ideology and calling it economics pretending, you know, it's a real field of study and, and there's some sort of objective scientific analysis going on here, when really it's nothing more than a, a bourgeois dogma of religion um, that worships capital. 
The basic mistake of not understanding how wealth is created. I love that they say they Systemic. we don't understand how wealth is created. And productive. Sorry. Yeah, right. Right. Well, they you don't even just explain how wealth is created. <laughs> <laughs> Surplus value. Production will see the quality of life for everyone decline. Often, politicians today will not go so far as to call for the socialization of every part of the Sorry, they just said it causes every area of life to decline. Again, something that's empirically false. Like Howard Waitzkin did a full comparative study of socialist to capitalist countries, and the socialist countries outperformed them in terms of standard of life. And if you look at any socialist country, what did they have before and then what did they have after the revolution? Massive increases in education, health care, um, feeding people, combating malnutrition and um, all sorts of good things that have improved people's lives. But the the neoclassicals don't deal with empirical data. Right. They don't deal with reality. You can explain this to them and they'll they'll just find some way to explain it away and say, no, no, no. That was because of capitalism. Um, it was because they didn't fully abolish private markets, that the markets were able to increase people's standard of living. It's again, it's nothing but a, a dogma. There's no science going on here. The economy only for certain sectors like healthcare, roads and education. While a mixed economy of markets and socialist services can function better than a purely socialist economy, there are problems that still exist. For example, yeah, let's privatize the fucking roads and let's get rid of Medicare and Medicaid, the only public part forms of healthcare that we have that are the only reason there's only 40,000 people dying because they don't have access to healthcare in this country instead of freaking 200,000 or, or way more if you got no. rid of Medicare and Medicaid. I had a uh, uh, professor who believed adhered to this neoclassical ideology um and uh she also worked for uh the insurance industry um and i can't remember where i was going with that now i think i oh sorry sorry i confronted her with the evidence i said our healthcare system is the only one that's highly privatized you know and we're the only one that have this for-profit insurance industry and 40,000 people are dying in America every year because they don't have access to health insurance, whereas that doesn't happen in other countries. You know what she said? She said, oh, well, I'm sure those studies were made up or those studies were funded by leftists. So, again, you can present empirical data to these people um, who adhere to this ideology. And if they really adhere to it, like my economics professor did, they will find some way to explain it away. Anything that says, you know, central planning or, or the government could do something good is literally fake. It was created by the the big lobby of socialists um, that's out there funding research, I guess. Uh, we got to get them to hit us up and give us some money. Right. It's <laughs> wild to me that people can seriously, like, think about who it, who it is telling us this. It is literally the people who want to own our shit. What little stuff is owned by the people, they want to take it for themselves and they're like, yes, but you will be better off if I own everything and sell it to you. <laughs> that's basically what they're saying. Yes. And people are like, that's that makes sense. Absolutely. It's exactly what they're saying. And then they frame freedom <laughs> then right. equals freedom for the owning class to own everything and, and sell it back to you. <laughs> well, a truly socialist healthcare system forces decisions about the use of scarce resources like hospital beds machines and oh my that is the dumbest argument i have every single healthcare system has scarce resources every single healthcare system rations goods it doesn't matter if it's capitalist or socialist or feudal again every single healthcare system has a limited amount of resources and they have to ration it you know what we ration it by in the united states by your pocketbook. If you have enough money to afford health care, you get really good health care. You can have access to all sorts of specialists. It's going to be extremely expensive, but who cares? You have money, right? You know who the health care system doesn't work for? People who can't afford super expensive specialists. That's why 40 to 60,000 people die every year in this country, despite the fact that we have or spend more money on health care than any other country by far. Because we have to ration that care and we ration it by you get care if you're rich, you don't if you're poor. What socialized medicine does is rations care by need. It says we have a limited amount of resources. Whoever needs it more, whoever you know has life-threatening illnesses gets it first. Whereas in the U.S., millions of dollars are spent on like men's balding, um, 
uh, medicine and cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery, shit aimed for super rich people or aimed at super rich people. That is where our limited, our scarce goods go in a privatized capitalist healthcare system. In a socialized healthcare system, our healthcare resources go towards people with cancer and people who actually fucking need it. I'm, this is kind of my, my thing is healthcare right now. So I get real fired up about these bullshit arguments. And the scarcity is uh, connected to what's invested in what. The scarcity at times is artificial just because it's not profitable to invest more in that area. For instance, you did an article a while back on the scarcity of hospitals in rural parts of America. Was it scarce because we don't have the resources to provide people in the rural parts of America with hospitals that are not three, four hours away from their homes? No, that's not the way that it was scarce. It was scarce because they just didn't invest in it because it wasn't profitable, right? So the scarcity is itself artificial because capitalist production is production for the sake of profit. And if you cannot realize profit, you don't develop production in those areas. And that's why it becomes a fetter on the development of humanity, on the development of the forces of production. And you see the complete opposite, you see the complete opposite in China which as soon as COVID hit, they were able to build like 10 hospitals or a hospital in less than 10 days. And just these massive hospitals and these massive infrastructures that were done through central planning. The most efficient parts of the capitalist economy is itself done through planning. There's a wonderful book called The People's Republic of Walmart that goes through how it is that Walmart participates in planning in order to succeed. And the question is, what are they planning for? What's the end, the telos of the planning? It's profit. Now, the question is, what would the telos, what would the end of the planning be in socialism? It's for the good of the people. It's whatever the people need. And so it's, you know, to have this dichotomy of, uh, of, of planning and market and then the scarcity, the scarcity is artificial. The scarcity is artificial. When you have the capacity to produce in accordance to what it is that people need, to what it is that's going to make people's lives easier to be flourishing, you're going to be able to break through all of those scarcities as we've seen in China, especially when you're not burdened down by you know, a blockade like, for instance, Cuba is. The idea that we have scarcity in 2023 is absolutely absurd. There are so many news stories about millions and millions of tons of food being destroyed while people go hungry. Well, between one in five and one in eight children go hungry in this country, right? So the what was the food just scarce so they had to drive up the prices so these kids can't eat? No, there's far more than enough food. We have what's called the crisis of overproduction within capitalism. And this is explained from Marx, but basically we make so much for profit. And the the working end is also the buying end. What's made mathematically is always more than what can purchase, right? So uh, I, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but the idea, basically, the idea that these things are scarce is absolute fucking nonsense. Medicines to be decided not by individuals, families, or doctors, but by government planners. While patients of that's bullshit. Because in Cuba, I know. You see it in the polyclinic model, it's like so embedded in the community with the nurses, with the doctors, and everyone else. It's just lying. You know, there's this thing that this great Mexican historian says. Uh, he's a the biographer of Che. He's got a massive Che biography. His name is uh, um, uh, Pablo Ta Taibo II or something. Uh, he's got somewhat of a weird name. But one of the statements that he makes is that, you know, you. What you have to ask of reactionaries is at least to be honest, right? They can be the pieces of shit that they want to be, but at least stop lying. Say the truth. And the stuff that they're saying is just verifiably untrue. Look at any socialist system. The planning is not just these government bureaucrats that are disconnected from any of the people that are going to get the treatment or that are going to get the services that are being planned for. The planning is done by the people that are engaged in those activities. And yes, at some point it ripples upward to the bureaucrats, but their decisions are based on the stuff that's being done by the people that are there. As opposed to when it's, you know, uh, when it's capitalism, the CEOs don't know what the fuck is going on. They don't know if the doctor tells them, yeah, we need to continue these services in the rural uh, regions of the country because people need them. If they're not profitable, 
the capitalist is not going to stay there. Yeah, it's the exact opposite, right? It's socialist healthcare, like the healthcare in Cuba that brought healthcare even to the rural areas by the Escom bride, um, that was based on what individuals, families, and doctors want, right? They want to bring healthcare to the entire country. Um, versus in the U.S., we've had 100 rural hospitals shut down um, in the last 10 years, well over 100 rural hospitals, and we've written on this, because like Carlos said, it's not profitable. So it's the exact inverse, right? They say that under capitalism, these are the people running healthcare. How? How? <laughs> how, how did individuals, families, and doctors uh, influence the COVID response? Maybe doctors to some degree, and most physicians at this point own their own practices, so they're essentially capitalists, but it was controlled by government bureaucrats and more importantly, the pharmaceutical corporations or giant uh, giant corporations owned by a handful of shareholders. Eddie, how many doctors times? even weren't really doctors that were practicing medicine. They were doctors involved in administration and in the World Health Organization and in propaganda. I mean, for real, like... I. People might give me some some guff for this, but Fauci was saying contradictory things from week to week. So his job at that point was to lie to us sometimes, no matter well, which way you look at it. The, I mean, and this video shows the exact inverse. These are the government planners. How? This is the <laughs> shareholders. These right. are the people selling you medicine and running out the back door. And using intellectual property laws to make sure that cheaper generic medicine isn't produced or even imported, right? This and is exactly the how the healthcare system. Like this is insulin. exactly this is exactly how the healthcare system works under capitalism, and they and, just invert it. Yeah, it's it's a topsy turvy view. And uh, I wanted to ask, because the last one uh, it, it mentions family and and nurses and doctors. How many times have either you had when you were younger, when you were a kid? a nurse or a doctor at your house? I'm guessing the answer is never. I was just looking at these old cassette videos of me in, in Cuba, and there was always this random lady that I had no idea who it was, and that was the nurse, the polyclinic nurse, and everyone had one. There, You always had a fucking nurse in your house that would visit you every week that was so embedded with the family that knew what fucking Abuelita was doing and how everyone in the house was doing because it's, it's completely embedded in the community and that's why it's so successful and it's capable of being preventative, right? As opposed to just reacting to when people get sick. So it's, it's, it's all bullshit. Everything that they've spewed in this video has all been lies. And I want to say too, too at the level, I want to say too, at the level of healthcare administration in the U S they understand what needs to be done to improve healthcare. They understand that having people embedded in the community, who have a more holistic view of health, who understand the problems that their patients are going going through, you know, is is a better way to go about things and a better way to provide people health care because you have to address a lot of social factors. They know that preventative medicine is better than just, you know, covering up people's symptoms with medication. They know this. But the discussion is, how do we do this? How do we get to this? Because the whole system is run by shareholders and bureaucrats who are just going to do whatever's better for profit. Preventative medicine is terrible for profit. You want a sick population who you can constantly throw pills at um, to make money off of. You do not want a healthy population um, where preventative medicine is key. Or, 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 I mean, where preventative medicine um, and healthcare is emphasized. Uh, I mean, look how long they hid the research on tobacco from us. They knew for a fact how deadly tobacco was. They knew it was addictive. They knew it caused cancer. And they hid this research. The big tobacco cartel hid the research to keep selling cigarettes. And guess what? That falls right in line with the healthcare industry because it's about selling us things. And not even us, but rich people who can afford it. When I was 12, my mom had a giant heart attack, right? Worst thing that had happened to my family by at the time, she had multiple heart attacks and needed a heart transplant. At the time, this was experimental technology, right? And she had to get on this thing called a heart mate, which was uh, only open to certain people and would cost millions and millions of dollars. My dad and some doctors had to lie to get her involved in this just to save her life. Otherwise, 
us being just a regular poor working class family, my mom wouldn't be alive today. It's so beyond fucked up that they can sit here and make this video lying about it because it kills people. It genuinely fucking kills people. It almost makes you think, sorry, Mm -hmm. it it almost makes you think whether there's like communists inside the Mises Institute because this is so very clearly the stupidest place (laughs) that they should be arguing for a free market for, especially in the U.S., especially in the U.S. where so many, literally everyone is affected by how stupid having uh, the the private healthcare for profit model in medicine is, it's almost as if they're trying to look like they're idiots, and their ideology makes no fucking sense. No kidding. Why would you highlight healthcare? Like this? <laughs> I go to Medicare. You know what the most highly approved of insurance premiums are in the entire country? Medicare and Medicaid. The only places where you can get insurance from the government. Mm-hmm. You know, more and more, though, it seems like the truth is becoming so essential to people that this kind of thing is doing what Carlos was just saying, having the reverse effect. Right. Back maybe 20 years ago, people bought it. There was a big fad of libertarians, if you remember. Uh, but now, not so much. People need the truth because the reality is we can't keep going on in the old way. Things are reaching a point where something's going to happen. Something's going to give. So not to change the subject, but organize right now. Join the Communist Party. Join whatever is around. Build a union. Meet the people in your neighborhood. Organize now. We need to do this together. Because otherwise, it's going to be wackadoos like the people who made this video running things. And yeah. Uh, I want to just get to uh, two comments here because they're connected to the polyclinic uh, uh, point that we made. SM uh, Palazzolo, uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. He says, I'm old. I did Dr. Livner on the corner. Yeah, you get that in uh, in uh, in certain rural communities. There's a show on Netflix that's uh, it's a ch- a, a, what they'd call a chick flicks, but uh, it's enjoyable. It's called Virgin River, and you have the the doctor in the community and it's, it's, he's still very much embedded in the community, but that's like basically gone, uh, a, a long gone reality. And most of the U S as hospitals and community clinics have continued to just, uh, leave communities. And, uh, Kyle Pettis says, when I lived in Nicaragua, I had a Cuban doctor that came to my house when I had, uh, Chicayunga, I'm guessing I'm pronouncing that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it was the best, most personal care I ever had. Right. And, uh, you know, the part of what the Cuban surplus of doctors has afforded Cuba to do is send doctors all over the place. You know, the slogan is uh, doctors, not bombs. The U.S. sends bombs. Cuba sends doctors. So uh, that experience that you had in Nicaragua is one that people in Venezuela have had. It's one that people in Brazil had. Like Bolsonaro, when COVID started, he sent the Cuban doctors back and then he had to ask for them to come back because, you know, everything went to shit. So people around the world have had those uh, experiences. And um, Helen uh, Yaffe, uh, who's one of the leading scholars in the English world on Cuba, she cites that uh, millions, hundreds of millions of people have been treated by uh, Cuban doctors around the world and have had uh, have been either saved or have had their um, their illnesses uh, that treated by by cuban doctors yeah venezuela didn't even i mean cuba gives them doctors too but also cuba guided them with their programs aimed at expanding healthcare access and bringing it to the rural areas so they basically replicated the same thing cuba did with cuba's help and that's a form of central planning uh involving the government that vastly improved people's lives and brought people um an incredible amount of health care But these guys at the Mises Institute, they're so out of touch that in America, where 60 percent of our country, 60 percent of our country is at medical debt at some point. Um, They're they're telling you we can't do anything different than capitalism, guys. We'd lose our awesome health care system. And that's why people are starting to see through this shit, because so many of them have had a a terrible experience with this health care system that these guys are trying to uphold as the greatest. He's That's a, like if my boss were, you know, were to, to like come up to me and be like, hey, give me your house. Just give it to me. I want to make some money off of it. 
<laughs> you know, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's what privatization is. They just mm -hmm. have to dress it up with all this um, neoclassical nonsense. Um, yeah, it's a bunch of nonsense. It's all like mental gymnastics for the owners to go, we want to make more money selling you things. Let us own more to sell you. Let us make you dependent on us. So you need us. Right. That's, that's their, we don't that's their conclusion. Them. And then, you know, whatever mental gymnastics they have to do to say that that's the best way to go about things is what they do. It is a dogmatic faith. By the way, this is one of the ways I talk to libertarians too. And I explain like, why on earth do you want to be dependent on these corporations, these spoiled little rich kids that have never done a day's work in their life? You want to be dependent on them to get what you need? Man, stand up for yourself, you know? Doctor, they may face other critical obstacles like long wait times, medicine shortages, and rationing of care, all resulting in a lack of medical freedom. Economics explains why freedom makes society richer and more prosperous. The case for socialism so that that's what i was saying earlier is they then equate any privatization with freedom it all equals freedom and all it means is freedom for what noah said your your boss to own everything and then to sell it back to you that's what that's what freedom is freedom for capital is not grounded in economics but an appeal to equality not true the result is to make people equally poor We've known people who have died because they've had to ration their insulin and, and other medicine in the U.S., right? We know how long it takes for people to just get basic appointments um, to the doctor, especially in rural areas of the country. You know, it could take months for them to get uh, uh, to get seen, right? So it's so absurd. They're talking about long wait lines, rationing, and whatever the other third thing was. All of those are things that are endemic to American capitalist healthcare and that virtually are inexistent in other socialist forms of healthcare. And the few times that you have rationing that's needed, it's because the country cannot get resources because of the blockade. I recently wrote a paper for Science for the People magazine on the effects of the US blockade on Cuban medicine and the shortages that are caused by Cuban uh, uh, in, in the Cuban healthcare system by the blockade, which is a dynamic blockade that you know shifts its its ways around, so that any way that the U.S. Uh, that the Cuban government finds to negotiate with a company from around the world, it can adjust itself eventually, so that you know it's 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 a dynamic blockade that reacts to the Cuban reactions to try to you know work around the blockade, and it's you know all of every I want. I, I know it sounds bold, but it's not when you study this. Every single central problem that the Cuban economy faces, but their healthcare system in particular, is tied to the blockade. It's tied to the blockade and the inability to access things that are absolutely crucial in order for, for the economic well-being of the country.